Good afternoon. It is now three o'clock p.m. and I would like to call this meeting to order. Uh, at this time, uh, if Mr. Damon could do the roll call. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Kalushi. Ms. Bayless. Don't see Ms. Bayless yet. Mr. Bell. Okay. Mr. Berryhill. Vice President Kalushi, your own uh, Captain Ford. Captain Ford, can you hear me? I see your name. With... Here. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kim. Mr. Morello. Superintendent Norton. Ms. Ritchie? Yep. Mr. Silvio? I'm here. Mr. Shirley? 
Present. Good afternoon. It is now three o'clock p.m. and I would like to call Present. this meeting to order. Mr. Tabardo. I'm here. Mr. Morello, got you joining us. All right, President Pelosi, we have 10 of our 13 board members on, and if other ones come in, we will bring them into the, to the meeting as they log in. Perfect. Thank you, um, Mr. Damon. At this time, I just want to welcome everybody and thank you from for taking the time to be here with us today. I just want to reiterate that this is an informational question and answer session to have our staff available to us to answer any questions that we may have in preparation for the November meeting. I want to welcome all of you. I want to thank you first and foremost for entrusting me to be the president of uh, this esteemed organization. I thank you all for your time, for your efforts, because this is uh, a very big commitment and it's a very important um, work that we do for the students and the families of the state of Florida. So thank you, thank you so much for your vote of confidence. And I wanna move forward at this time, we will stop promptly at 4.30 because I know you're all taking time out of your busy schedules. So I will move the meeting along uh, as efficiently as possible. And getting all of those questions is if you want to refer, for, request any data, any information, now is the time to do so in preparation for our November meeting. At this time, I know that there are a few of us I, uh, that may have had some questions at the last board meeting about Sunshine. Um, some people may be new to a board and, and serving on a board. So I think it's very important that we cover very briefly with Mr. Ireland, public records requests that were, uh, so, uh, you know that we are required to produce if, if as members of this board, if asked. Also, sunshine laws and as they apply to us as a board. And also, we will be conducting our meetings under, as of course, Robert's Rules of Order, and that is um, the, the 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 rules that we'll be following during the, the meetings to run them in an orderly fashion with decorum and with the respect for every mm -hmm. member of this board to be able to express their opinions, their views in an efficient and professional manner. So with that, I wanna turn it over to uh, our attorney, Mr. Ireland, to go over the Sunshine Law, Public Records and Robert's Rules of Order. And at the, at the appropriate time, if anybody has questions, just raise your hand, I'll be jotting down um, and when I call on you, then you can go ahead and ask any questions you may have. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Ireland. Thank you, President Kalushi. Uh, I'm going to ask to talk about the Sunshine Law, Public Records Law, Financial Disclosure, which I think is another thing, and Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, begin with the uh, Sunshine Law. This is both statutory and constitutional. Uh, there have been many cases on it since 1971, maybe it was 67, whenever it was adopted by the legislature. Uh, there's no question that uh, FHSA is covered. Much to my chagrin, I found a, uh, uh, and I sent you out a memorandum, statement sent you out a memorandum that I just recently wrote. Uh, basically, uh, in 1998, which is uh, over a quarter of a century ago now, uh, the uh, Attorney General gave an opinion uh, that I was involved in securing, and I'm embarrassed to know, to, to believe that I can't remember that. I didn't remember that to now, but you have a copy of that. There's no question that we're covered, uh, and anything I will say today is either covered by that memorandum or by the memorandum that's in the notebook that you received at the September meeting. I'll be using a PowerPoint that uh, the president was uh, kind enough to give us that was prepared by the Walter Harvey General Counsel for the day the uh, School Board of Dade, Dade, Miami, Miami, Dade County. And if you can pull that up for me now, I appreciate it.
And again, uh, I give credit to uh, Mr. Harvey and his staff for this presentation. Uh, and uh, we'll go to the next slide. All right, the Sunshine Law is basically the principles of all meetings where official action is taken must be publicly noticed and open to the public. Official action takes just those things that you would expect, which is a vote, resolution, rule, formal action, or discussion. Uh, even if you have organizational meetings, if there's any action taken uh, at which two or more board members are present, uh, no matter what you call the meeting, it's subject to the Sunshine Law. A notice to the public must be reasonable and published, and that's the duty of staff. Uh, there's a link to the uh, Sunshine Law manual, which I have a copy of, and it's produced by the uh, Attorney General's office. Anybody wants to go further behind that, it covers also Governor of the Sunshine and the uh, public records law. Uh, votes must be recorded, accounting for each member present at the meetings. The votes can be uh, audible by a roll call or a voice vote or written ballots, but if there are written ballots, uh, those ballots have to be made available to the public. And no secret votes are permitted. And minutes must be taken of the meetings, even if they are recorded. Meetings must be held in a location and facility that's reasonably accessible to the public and that does not discriminate. Uh, no two or more members may meet to discuss any matter on which foreseeable action will be taken by the board. And that's the, that's the key is whether the board will be taking foreseeable action on the issue that's being discussed. Uh, even if it's a publicly noticed meetings as those that we have here and as those today, uh, no private discussions are allowed uh, on matter except at the for the private discussion to allow. Uh, each board member may meet with staff, and uh, this is true for uh, their alternates. Sunshine Law applies not just to in-person meetings, but to telephone conversations, email, communications through other social media, such as Facebook. Members may also not use staff to serve as a conduit about the matters. In other words, you can't come to executive director and say, uh, how does a board member uh, X feel about this matter. They may be told on scheduling issues without violating the Sunshine Law. Board members are not prohibited from meeting socially as long as a matter that comes before the board is not discussed. Now, I know that uh, those of you who are coming in from out of town, be staying at uh, motels and hotels together, you be having meals together, and you just got not to discuss anything that may become before the board. And it doesn't have to be on the agenda, but it may be a subject that, that can come before some date in the future. Again, the social networking uh, is suggested that you not communicate with each other through social network, uh, friends, and that type of thing, because it gives the appearance of a violation of the sunshine law. Individual board members and assistants are not prohibited from meeting privately, and it just says superintendent, but it's executive director of staff for information purposes, such as we're doing today. And the district staff should not poll members of uh, on issues that might come before the vote. And the consequences of violation of the Sunshine Law includes the fact that the board's action on any matter that has been discussed outside of the uh, board uh, is null and void, and there are fines and criminal penalties uh, against violators. Now, that's all I have. The Sunshine Law, again, it's in the memorandum that you have both. One that's in the notebook that you got in September meeting and the one that you received today. With that, we'll move to the public records law. Uh, public records includes basically anything that's not exempt that comes into this office, no matter how it got here. Uh, and once it hits this office, it's subject to the public records uh, being, being requested through a public records request. That's about all you really, really need to know as members of the board because the rest of it is taken care of by staff. Ms. Roar does an excellent job on an almost daily basis of responding to public records requests. Uh, so just remember that anything you send here, no matter how it gets here, uh, it's subject to being uh, put in the newspaper, put, put all the legislature put anywhere. That's all I have for that. Let's go. Yes, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Because, according to Florida statutes, and I can give you the name, it's 112.3145. 
as an appointed member of a board that has statewide jurisdiction, you are a state officer. And as a state officer, you're required to file statements of financial interest with the Commission on, Commission on Ethics. Right, go to the next one. Beginning in January of 2024, all of those forms have to be filed electronically. Uh, you can contact the uh, Commission on Ethics uh, to determine what the forms are and how they get there, or if you can contact this office, we'll give them the link to the disclosure for it. That's it. That's, that's um, all that we do. Yeah. The next thing that I'll be talking about is the Robert's Rule of Order. All right. Um, the order was originally published in 1876 by General Henry M. Roberts, who was a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, up and became a general. And it was basically based on the fact that he was required to chair a meeting one time, and there was so much chaos, he decided to devote the rest of his life to developing parliamentary procedure rules. The Robert Truth Order, based on a regard for the rights of the majority, of the minority, especially a strong minority, more than a third, of the individual members of the board and of absentees, and all of these together. They're designed for the orderly conduct of a meeting so that the business which the body can be accomplished in an efficient manner. The basic rules are these. The chairperson is always in control. No one speaks unless recognized by name by the chair. No action is taken unless the motion has been made and duly seconded. No discussion on action item unless the motion has been made and duly second. If these bases are followed, it should result in a productive meeting. Uh, Madam Chair, that's all I have in this presentation. If there's any questions subject to your approval. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ireland. At this time, if you have any questions regarding Sunshine Law, public record, financial disclosure, Robert's Rules of Order, um, please feel free to just raise your hand. I'll make a note of your name and I'll call on you. Any questions on those items right now uh, before we move forward? Okay, seeing none. Um, yes, yes. Uh, just, just want to acknowledge that uh, Ms. Bayless and Mr. Kenna are all here, so now we have all 13 board members present. Perfect, excellent. Um, those of you that are just joining, thank you so much for joining and uh, welcome. Uh, at this time, I just want to just reiterate Robert's Rules of Order. Um, I know that we are all professionals on this, uh, this, this board. I welcome you all. I look forward to serving with you. Uh, I know that we're going to have, we're going to do great work as, a, as, a, as colleagues on this board. And I just have very high expectations for what we're gonna to accomplish together for the benefit of our student athletes in the state of Florida. So the only thing that I really, really am going to uh, request from all of you is just your cooperation. I know that when we're in the middle of discussing something, everybody wants to jump in, but we have to follow Robert's rules of order and just wait until I call on you just so that we can maintain order and proceed in an efficient, productive manner. And those are, uh, if you have any questions for me at this time, please feel free to ask. And if not, we will just move forward with- Point of, clar point of clarification, Adam Chair. Absolutely. Yes, Mr. Norton. Today is considered a workshop, not a meeting, correct? Correct. So we really only take action at meetings, but we can discuss within the sunshine everything during the workshop. During the workshop, we can discuss no, we're not discuss we're just taking questions. We're not doing if you have a specific question to the classification for staff, absolutely. But we're not we're gonna have discussion about the item. Things that our input will be at the November meeting. That is my understanding of this. Mr. Damon, I'll refer to you. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct, Mr. Allen. Yes, uh, there will not be any sharing of input, sharing of ideas. That's that's the I think that's the way the cases are stated. 
question. Yes. yes. Okay. And the questions at this point will be directed to staff so that they can answer any questions that you may have. We will not be discussing with one another. That will occur at the November meeting. Am I correct on that, Mr. Ireland? Yes, yes. Sure. Okay, perfect. Mr. Norton, is that does that uh, suffice with your perfect? Excellent. Okay, so let's um turn at this point turn it over to uh, Mr. Jameson, who's going to go over the classification and answer any questions. And again, I just ask that you raise your hand so that I can call on you in, in an orderly fashion. All right, thank you all um, for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, looks like it started it over for me, so let me just get through. All right. Um, again, so what I uh, what I will do is um, first uh, the classification task force members. These are the 17 individuals from across our great state that uh, got together uh, over the course of many meetings and many hours to um, come up with this proposal. Um, as you can see, all the names there that come from all across the state. I can leave that up there for a moment. Um, and and uh, President Colucci, however you'd like to handle the questions, if you'd like to do it after each section or at the very end, I'm at your, however you'd like to do that is, is completely however, however you want. I think the best way for me, at least because on my screen, I can't see everyone because you're sharing your screen. So let's go through the slide presentation first, and then afterward we can could go through all the questions because that way I can see this everybody on the screen at once and identify who has questions. So Sounds I great. just ask the board to make your questions as you go along, so that if there's a part that you need to refer back to, we can pull it up at that time. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So the first thing um, that we wanted to cover was to was to um, show you how we currently do our classification. So um, in football, football is a little bit different than our other sports. Um, that was as of last year. Uh, last year was the first year for the new um, metro, suburban, and rural setup. Um, this is our second year of that setup. And essentially, um, the metro is the eight most populated counties in the state of Florida make up the metro. And then the 59 other counties make up suburban. And then the rural schools currently have to have less than 600 students and they have to be in the rural economic development, um, have to be registered or have to be recognized by REDI um, as being rural. And they would qualify for that division in football as well. That goes for the other sports that have a uh, rule as well. In the other sports, um, in our uh, major team sports, baseball, softball, soccer, basketball, girls, volleyball, um, right now, and including all of our individual sports and other, it is done via student enrollment only. Um, each sport does have a different number of classifications based upon how many teams declare and participate in that sport. Um, so, for example, soccer has six classifications currently, 2A through 7A. They do not have a rural division, whereas volleyball, baseball, softball, basketball all have a rural. So they are 1A through 7A and have seven classifications currently rural in our team sports is referred to as 1A. That is our rural division. Um, in our other smaller team sports, they have uh, upwards of two or three classifications, um, sometimes one classification, and then our individual sports um, have up to four. They're allowed to have up to four classifications in those individual sports. Once a determination has been made on how many teams are participating in a particular sport, um, we use a map to then uh, use geography to divide into regions and districts to the best of our ability, um, trying as best as possible to divide them evenly, uh, taking into account obviously travel, um, distances, sometimes it's, it's easier said than done in certain areas of the state, but we do do our best um, under the current model to uh, spread them out as evenly as possible to get as many teams in the same area as we can based upon again how many teams happen to be there in that certain classification based on their school size. Um, in each of these classifications, 
the numbers that each class may, or excuse me, in each sport that each classification may have um, is determined by uh, how many teams in, in the, the distance. So from 601 to 1700, maybe one class or 600 to 1200 in a different sport. It's not all consistent right now on how that's broken down because it, it matters about how many teams are participating in each sport. So that is, is sort of a um, quick uh, rundown of how we currently are doing our classifications. So the new structure would only affect team sports. So this new proposal that I'm going to go through here is only going to affect team sports. Individual sport classification would remain the same. And the reason behind that is because the rankings are a huge part of the new proposal. So a ranking system in whatever fashion that may be, when all is said and done, um, is again, a big backbone of the new proposal and individual sports do not use the same max prep FHSAA power rankings. And so currently those, the plan is to leave those the same for now um, and continue to evaluate how we can uh, possibly include individual sports at another time per the uh, task force. Classification for team sports would still be determined by school enrollment. Um, it would be the same process. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more here with this next slide. Um, there are some differences. So they will still be determined by school enrollment. <coughs> However, the sports you see listed there, baseball, boys and girls basketball, football, boys and girls soccer, girls volleyball and softball will be classified into eight classifications. Rural is no longer referred to as 1A, rural is, is rural and then you would have 1A through 7A. Um, one caveat with that is rural. In order for a rural division to exist in said sport, there must be 24 schools that participate. Under the current uh, proposal, rural would be the rural cutoff. So currently it's at 600 students. The rural cutoff would be determined by football. So we would take um, a number of teams in football and then that top enrollment number of the highest enrolled school in football would be the cutoff for the other sports. So we would still have the uh, 32, I believe is that correct? We have some 32 teams in rural um, with 24 making the playoffs still in the other sports. That number of rural teams could be more than 32. It would be based upon the number of the highest enrolled school in rural. So that could be 588, it could be 550, it could be 600, it could be somewhere in there. And that is what we'll base the other sports uh, off of, would be off of football's numbers. <clears throat> the sports you see there, boys and girls lacrosse, boys and girls water polo, beach volleyball, boys volleyball, and flag football will be divided into classification, classifications based upon their size. Uh, currently lacrosse has two, water polo has one, flag football has two, and beach volleyball has one. A couple of those may be expanding. We've had a lot of interest um, in some of those sports in terms of growth, they are exploding, um, flag football being one, beach volleyball being another, um, that we could see added classifications based upon the number of teams, which is, which is a great thing. Um, and so th those numbers could change, but that they, we do not have enough teams in those sports currently to have uh, eight classifications, um, 1A through 7A plus rural. So these sports would be um, handled a little bit differently in terms of how they are classified and structured. So this is getting into football a little bit more specifically um, because there are some changes to football um, with this um, proposal. Uh, with this proposal, the sport of football would no longer require mandatory district competition at any um, any of the classification levels during the regular season. Currently, rural does not require, does not have districts. They just, they actually don't have districts, so there's no required district play. We would still keep districts in the other classification. Rural would stay the same at, under this proposal with no districts based on the number of teams and the distance between the teams. Um, districts are a little bit harder to create um, where the travel distance is reasonable. Um, but in 1A through 7A, we would still have districts. There would just no longer be mandatory district play. Those teams could absolutely play each other should they choose to schedule each other, but they would not be mandated as they currently are to play that district schedule. 
All schools that participate in the football state series would schedule nine regular season games. Currently, they are able to schedule 10. This would allow for nine. Um, with all schools required to leave week 11 uh, vacant with no game. So no team should have a game scheduled on week 11. Um, that is the week that we will have our district championship weeks. They will occur on week 11. After week nine, the FHSAA power rankings would be used to determine the top two ranked teams in each district. So if there's five teams in a district, and uh, the top two teams are ranked number 10 and number 12 overall. And the other three teams are all under that. That number 10 and number 12 team would play. And the number 12 team would travel and play at the number 10 team. The winning team would receive an automatic bid into uh, the state playoffs, the regional round of the playoffs. The remaining teams after week nine, after those district, those two district teams are determined by the rankings. Every other team in the state then has the opportunity to schedule a week 11 game to fill out their 10 game schedule. The 10 game maximum regular season will not change. The change will be in the initial nine regularly scheduled games. And the reason for that is if a team schedules 10 and then ends up playing um, in that district champion, it would put them over the uh, maximum number of contests, which would then um, create an issue with the rankings and with policy. Um, and that's what that last line down there talks about uh, that 10th game in week 11. I apologize that that's uh, blocking out some of it. Uh, now we're going to discuss the open division. This was, this was a big, um, this, this would be probably the biggest change um, to the current classification. Uh, there are some other states that do something similar to this. Um, and what this would do is would create a division that would consist of the top ranked teams in each sport competing in their own bracket. So every team will still be classified at the beginning of a classification cycle. Currently the classification cycle is every two years. That would stay the same under this proposal. So it'd still be a two year classification cycle. And each year, um, those teams, or excuse me, every two years, if let's say a school is put into 4A, um, for a particular sport, and they finish in the top 32, 16, or 8. You can see at the bottom, each sport will be divided out um, in the number of teams under this proposal that will be in the open division. They would then be pulled out of the 4A, 5A, 6A rural. It's open to any um, qualifying team uh, that qualifies via the rankings to play in the open division. They would then be moved into that open division, which would create a ninth playoff bracket, um, uh, for each sport and those teams would then compete in their own championship outside. So they would not compete in both. Um, that is a question we've had. Would they be in both? No, they would not. They would be removed from their 4A, 5A, rural, 1A, whatever they happen to be in and moved into that open division and compete against teams from across the state, from across different classification levels with the idea being that those are the top teams that season. And now they have an opportunity to be the top team um, in the state of Florida, having won that uh, winning this open division. And again, down at the bottom, obviously, if there's only one classification, such as um, water polo, there is not enough teams um, to have 32 or even 16. So there would be eight, the top eight teams in the power rankings would be pulled into the open division. If there's three to four classes, it would be 16. And currently, um, what the current proposal reads is five to eight classes, which would be the um, rest of the major team sports would be a 32 team open division bracket. I wanted to just show here, I have a couple different sports. This is from two years ago, 21, 22. These were the final boys basketball rankings. So you can see there was a spread. There was teams um, from 2A all the way to 7A um, that qualified. Those are the teams uh, that would have been in the bracket. And you can see uh, one would have played 32 theoretically under the current proposal. Uh, two would play 31, 3, 30, and so on, um, structured through a regular bracket with the higher seed hosting in those instances. Um, another question we've received is if those teams are the district champion and they're pulled into the open division, 
Um, it does not leave a vacant spot in the 4A or 3A bracket. What that does is the next highest ranked team um, per that region would then be pulled into uh, the eighth spot in that uh, region for, for the uh, playoffs. And again, whether that's 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, et cetera. Um, that, this is another example. This was the final girls soccer rankings from 21-22. So you can see again, a widespread 2A all the way to 7A um, would be involved in this. Uh, and there, again, there's no 1A in soccer, but you can see that uh, the spread from across the state would be participating in that. Uh, some some concerns that we heard. I wanted to go ahead and just put these out there. These are some concerns for um, the board to consider. Um, we've heard some concerns that they're, they're, they believe 32 is too many in the open division. Um, the task force believes that 32, and, and we actually had um, some more discussion at it at another uh, meeting, and they, they decided that they want to stick with 32 for those larger team sports because it will – um, capture all of the best teams in the state and allow all of them to participate for that open championship. Um, taking it down to 16, they don't believe would um, necessarily, if a team is, is really good, if the rankings don't shake out, they, want, they think 32 would definitely capture all of the top teams, whereas 16 in those larger team sports um, may not. But that is a concern. We've heard some people that 32 is too many, that the teams at the bottom wouldn't have um, as much of a chance um, and, and then looking at the top 32, they felt like there was a powerhouse, really good teams throughout um, the top 32 rankings, and that gave them the confidence to go with that number in those um, larger uh, team sports. Uh, another concern we've had are about the rankings. Are the rankings accurate enough? There are some, uh, some differences between the FHSA power rankings and the max preps rankings. Um, the main difference that, um, that we are aware of is the margin of victory. Max Preps does take a margin of victory into account. Um, margin of victory is something that has been discussed at our sport committee meetings um, over the last year. And uh, most of our, not all, but most of our sports are in favor of some sort of margin of victory. Um, two sports that from the meeting were not were baseball and softball. They did not believe a margin of victory component should be included. The uh, rest of the major team sports that could have a margin of victory um, thought that, and they've even given us numbers. Um, for example, football was working off of 17, um, soccer four across six. So basically cap that number so that they're not encouraging um encouraging unsportsmanlike blowouts and teams to just run the score up, uh, which was a concern um, from, from some uh, members of the previous board that they wanted to make sure that sportsmanship was still being uh, hung on to with this. And so that was removed. Um, however, for the accuracy of the rankings and the importance of the rankings with this, we have had some feedback from some people that they would like to see that. And so again, that has been discussed and that's, that's some information that we can provide absolutely. Um, in detail at the November board meeting should, should the board choose, and, and we can bring that uh, information as well. The third concern we've heard are the travel concerns from the Open Division. Um, if you saw, uh, uh, and I can even bring this back up, if you see some of these um, American Heritage Plantation in the first round will be traveling to Bartram Trail, that, that's quite a hike for a first round game. Um, now, some people have said, hey, it's the Open Division. This is uh, you know, something that uh, travels can be a part of it. However, um, we want to make sure we are being cognizant and, and being sensitive to the issues of the schools and uh, taking that into account. Um, there's been some thoughts of the North and South Division and then combining them at some point, reseeding. Um, there's been some ideas that have been floated um, by some, some individuals, some, some members that have, that have uh, expressed the concerns um, with the travel, especially for the first couple rounds. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we brought that uh, to the attention um, of the board as well. I want to make sure we were, we were up front with it and, and getting that out, uh, getting, getting out in front of it, I should say, uh, before the November meeting and any other subsequent uh, discussion that may occur. Um, that is uh, it from my end. Um, myself and Mr. Harrison are happy to take any questions that the board may have. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, that presentation. Um, at this time, if you could just stop, sh yeah, stop sharing the screen that way I can see everybody there. 
Um, and if at this time, I'll open it up for questions. Um, if you could just raise your hand, I'll jot down your names in order and we can have staff answer any questions or any requests for further information that you would like from here to the next board meeting. Okay, first I have uh, board member Bell, then board member Berryhill, and then board member Smith. Go ahead, um, Mr. Bell. Yeah, I just wondered if uh, we would be able to get a copy of this PowerPoint at our next meeting, or maybe it could be sent to us so we could kind of read over a little more. Sure, absolutely. Okay. I'll get it out. We can get it out today. Perfect. Um, Mr. Berryhill, uh, can go ahead. Yeah, I also wanted to point out that Mr. Shirley has his hand raised. A oh, little sure. I'm, I'm, oh, okay, <laughs> I, I see it there. It okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Shirley. His hand is way smaller than mine, so I just wanted to let... Yes, you know. thank you for bringing that to my attention. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, my question, I just want to ask a question to see if I'm allowed to ask a question. Am I allowed to ask about how the task force was created so we all have a perspective of that? Is that a question I can absolutely, ask? Absolutely, absolutely. You can ask any question you want to staff. Okay, so Scott, uh, Mr. Damon, Mr. Harrison, my question is kind of two parts. Um, who who selected the, I know that the former board asked for this task force to be created, um, but who picked the task force and then was uh, all of the sections, public and private, represented on the task force that came up with uh, this uh, option for classification. Okay. Mr. Damon, you want to defer to, uh, to answer it or have someone from staff answer? President Kalusha, I can answer that question. I was the one that selected the members of the task force, took into consideration public schools, private schools, large schools, big schools, rural areas, uh, folks that have been involved in committees in the past that were very outspoken that have reached out to their constituents to uh, gather the information and brought back the, uh, the consensus of the constituents, not just show their own personal views. So when we was putting together a group, I wanted to make sure we had coaches on that group. I wanted to make sure we had school ladies on that group, uh, district administrators. So it was a, a very diverse group that could bring forth diverse ideas. Uh, for example, Bobby Johns, who served on our board before, is also a head football coach that represents rural schools. It was very adamant that I put him on there because I do, one, he has a very strong connection with our coaches uh, across the state. So I tried to find folks that I knew would reach out to their constituents and bring forth uh, the thoughts and ideas of our school, our member schools. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question, Mr. Berryhill? Yeah, I guess maybe just kind of a, a follow-up. So it, it would be fair to say maybe that all of the sections, so like I'm section two private school, maybe my section wasn't 100% covered. However, there was a school or a school administrator or an AD like me, um, my size school, et cetera, represented on the task force? Yes, oh, sir. And I think in section two, um, we look to I think Mr. Fortier, who was also the superintendent of Catholic schools in section two. So it was a district level type administrator that would represent a large group of smaller private schools uh, in the section two area. He was one of the ones that we selected to serve on, on the committee. Thank you, that answers my questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, board member Berryhill. Uh, at this time, I have board members uh, Ryan Smith that had a question. May go ahead, sir. Yep, thank you very much. Um, I think we can say thank you, but I thank everybody for putting together this meeting. It's great we're getting information prior to going to November, so really appreciate that. I, my quick question is, um, Deputy Staff, do you, will this be the final proposal that's given to us for the November meeting, or do you anticipate any changes from that input that you um, saw on the last, or that you mentioned in the last slide, I should say? Um, the task force was comfortable with the proposal uh, as is, but they are also comfortable with any changes that the um, board would like to see to it as well. Thank you very much. Any other questions, follow-ups, Mr. Smith? No, thank you. Perfect. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay, next I have Mr. Uh, board Member Shirley. You go ahead, sir. Hey, uh, 
Thank you, President uh, Kaluti. Um, just as kind of a, I don't know, kind of a forewarning, is there anyone else who has their hand raised? Because I kind of have a little bit of a line of questioning, and I'd rather not overstep if it's redundant to other questions that are going to be posed. So okay. I don't mind being last. Okay, no problem. Does anybody else have a question at this point before? Okay. Um, so I'm going to wait, uh, Mr. Shirley, and then I'll go to Mr. Uh, Superintendent Norton. Go ahead, uh, sir. Yeah, and, and, and Board Member Shirley, I kind of feel the same way you do. I had a lot of questions and wrote a lot of notes down. And uh, just to address uh, Executive Director uh, Damon and staff, I, I know that a lot of work went into this. And uh, Bobby Johns, who was a past president of the prior board, uh, works with me for us here in Gulf County uh, as a football coach athletic director. And uh, uh, Mr. Barry Hill, I can tell you, Bobby and I aren't on the same page with everything. I have a lot of questions every time he presents it to me. And I know they're working hard for, for something. And before I ask a question of Greg, you know, I wrote down on my sheet of paper right here in front of me, I happened to get the, the pr privilege of playing on a state championship football team at Fort St. Joe High School in 1984. Uh, we beat Wildwood and uh, it was a grand experience. And so many people have asked me in my 12 plus years of being a school superintendent, uh, uh, it seemed to have, the system seemed to have worked just fine in 1984 with the districts and everything. Somebody at our organizational meeting said, you know, some districts only win district championships. I get it. I know a lot of work goes in. And one of the questions I would like Greg and staff to be prepared to answer, and maybe it will help all of us at our November board meeting. I know that there's public schools, private schools, big schools and large schools. I worked hard to, you know, not be called a rural school because I think it's a sometimes a demeaning epitaph. I, I'll accept 1A, you know, but I don't necessarily want to be called rural other than other people being called, you know, certain names they don't, monikers they don't want associated. I just think it's small and, and, and can be a little bit, whatever, lessening. But my question is this, could we, instead of just taking one big plan, and I'm, I'm addressing this to the board, be prepared to answer, could we take this sport by sport because whatever we do with football, you know, is its own creature. Uh, you know, I'll support whatever you guys want to do with water polo. I do have soccer here at one of my schools and they have to play, you know, a larger classification, which is fine. I can live in with that. But could we, you know, already feel like we're, we're quartered and diced and sliced uh, just to get to be able to bring up topics. But could we when, when it's appropriate, when it's necessary, could we pass, asking of staff, we pass these things for given sports, whether it's team sports, excluding football, uh, would that help? Because right now, it seems like everything's been thrown out to us to consider in one wash. Can we separate the wash here, you know, reds from whites and, you know, uh, and you know, maybe bite it off. I just want our board, this new board, to get it right. I don't want to pass a plan today and come back a year later and have to tweak it. So Mr. I just Gordon, want a lot I, more consideration to go into this. I, I um I understand your points and, and I at this time we're not taking any action. This is the perfect I, time to ask any questions that you have specific to this plan and any concerns that you do have, we will discuss them fully in November. We do not need to, as we said, vote on anything in November, but we can have a full discussion as a board. So I wanna lay your concerns to rest on that. But at this time, um, just for the purposes of this workshop, this, this particular plan, are there any questions specific to this for the intents of this particular workshop? Do you have any, Mr. Norton? Other than, I don't, than I've got other questions that we'll get to, but I'm fine for right now. 
for right now? Okay, I just want to make sure. I, I do want you to have the opportunity to ask questions, but I just want to make sure that that they're focused on what we're talking about here and we don't lose focus. Um, I hope those I, work. Those actually work. And taking those, the plan okay. that was presented today, I'm asking that in the future, so, when it's appropriate, can we can we dice and slice it sport by sport as necessary team from whatever? And I okay. ask that of staff. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ireland um, and uh, to uh, Executive uh, Director Craig to see if that's something appropriate to that we can discuss at this time or if that will be something. I, I can wait till November to discuss okay. that. No, I just want to make sure because I don't want you to lose. I don't want you to have missed an opportunity to ask something when it was appropriate. I, I don't want any of any of that to ever happen yes. while I'm, I'm chairing a meeting. So I'll, I'll defer to them at this time. We, we can discuss it in, in November meeting, but Mr. Norton, if you got questions specific, you can call me. We can I can try to answer your individual questions. And you're correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Norton, and thank you for your understanding. And I, I do hear your concerns, and I look forward to having a, a, a discussion about it uh, in November uh, at the board meeting. Anyone else have a specific question to this? Um, that they would like to ask about this particular classification. Um, okay, I guess I'll go ahead with Mr. Uh, Mr. Shirley. Thank you for your patience. Uh, no problem. Thank you, uh, President. And and I, I also want to echo uh, what Superintendent Norton said. That I understand that this task force undertaking is a huge amount of work and it's a huge amount of uh, pressure. Uh, no doubt about it. So I'm. My questions are going to come from uh, a couple of perspectives, a primary one being a financial one, uh, but also I'm going to work under the assumption that the purpose of the reclassification task force is one to ensure a kind of a leveling and a fairness of competition. Um, that's that's what I understand the purpose of the reclassification discussion to be is to make sure that the playing field is as fair and as level for all the teams involved as it possibly can be. And as as a board, I would think that would be our primary uh, goal as well. And so with that thought in mind, um, I, I'd like just a, a moment of background um, because this I've. I've and I'm and I'm talking primarily from a perspective of football uh, because I recognize that that is the primary financial breadwinner not only for FHSAA but for for most districts, especially most districts that have successful football programs. Um, I happen to be at a school that has a solid football program, but yet it's a football program that has never won a state championship that most people don't real, uh, don't necessarily realize. So my question is, based on this year's uh, state series, state final games, um, the average margin of victory was around 11 points or so. Um, the attendance rate was one of the highest rates that it's been in many, many years from my understanding. And so what was the, what was the primary driver and feeling the need to do a complete overhaul of that reclassification because I wasn't in on those conversations. So I'm just kind of curious the background on that. Sure, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that uh, question, President Kluge, if that's okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the primary driver, there has been a push um, for the last few years, I would say at least, if not longer, to reevaluate the way the classifications are done because they've been done the same way for decades and decades and decades. Football was the first time there was something that was done differently in terms of the way that um, the schools are divided like that, where they're divided in metro and suburban. Um, prior, it was just based upon the student enrollment, which is how the other sports was. There, there has been a push for a number of years. Um, from uh, the uh, FACA is another one of uh, the uh, coaches association has been um, pushing for that as well as other groups, schools. Um, and again, the board of directors requested of Mr. Damon to assemble a task force that could evaluate um, and take a look at there was no, there was not necessarily a directive to come up with something new. 
Um, there was a directive from the previous board for Mr. Damon to put together a task force that would review the current classifications and see if it could be done um, differently that would create um, a more equitable situation for all schools um, with competitive balance, competitive equity. And when the task force was meeting, they felt that all, all sports um, should be taken into account with that. Um, I, I agree, the football championships were, were great last year. There's no question about it. Um, not all area of the states, uh, not all areas of the state are thrilled with the Metro Suburban. And so that is something else that we, that was considered um, by the task force um, is that it is, it is uh, something that there is some duration in certain parts of the state with it. And so they took that into account when deciding whether or not all team sports would be considered, they were gonna pull different team sports out and have them classified differently. And the idea was they wanted to um, have the equity of all sports being created, um, classified, I should say, somewhat equitably. Um, but the main driving force was a push from membership and a push from um, some of our partners, such as, again, the FACA, um, to take a look at classification, to evaluate them and see if there is a, quote unquote, better way of doing them for all 800 and uh, I believe it's 828 schools in, uh, in our association. I hope that answers your question. It, it does, um, and, I, and I recognize that I'm sure some areas are not thrilled with that classification, but I think in all reclassification plans, there's probably some faction that will not be happy. Um, but when we look at a unit as a whole or an organization as a whole or a plan as a whole, uh, when we get competitive games and positive attendance, that seems like a success. So the follow-up to that uh, would be, so with the dissolution of the metro suburban type of idea, what was the idea behind keeping the 1A rural in place when in reality that was the metro suburban was really an offshoot of the 1A rural idea to begin with. So what, why not just include the 1A rural into 1A? Okay. Are you... Sorry, President Kalucci, I, I can answer that. Go ahead. What, um, and then I, I may pass it to Mr. Harrison here, if that's okay. Or, or, yes, uh, absolutely. Go ahead. Are you, referring, are you referring to the rural in the metro suburban model, or are you referring to the rural in the new proposed model by the task force? Well, in the metro suburban model, but even in even in the new model, what was the just what was the thought process be behind keeping the rural division period versus um if you're if you're only going based essentially on population size, then where is the where is the need for the rural classification at that point? Sure, and uh, for President Colucci, as uh, Scott mentioned, I can hop on this one if that's okay. Absolutely, go ahead. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, Mr. Shirley. So I, I think the task force considered the rural division has been in effect for uh, the traditional team sports. I want to say about 12 to 13 years now. Uh, so I think that that historical point of view, uh, they did not want to take take that away. And speaking on their behalf. Okay, Mr. Hey. Shirley, do you have? Are you satisfied with that answer? Or you have a follow up question. Uh, uh, that, that's that's an interesting answer, but at least it's an answer. Okay. Um, uh, so I do have some more follow up questions, but not, not directly with that. Go ahead. Um, so with the proposed structure of, of 1 through 7A, has did the task force give thought to the idea that by opening that up, doesn't that give, especially with a controlled open enrollment as it is um, in the state of Florida, by going to the 1 to 7A model, doesn't that potentially give just an inherent um, advantage to metro schools who are able to now pull from a larger population density in order to ensure that multiple teams are at a stronger stronger level, even though their school size is roughly the same as one of the schools that were previously considered suburban? Who will be answering? Uh, uh, Scott, I can answer that. Okay. Or attempt to. Um, I, I don't want to fully speak for the task force on this because I don't know that this was directly discussed too much. Um, I, I think you're referring just to football in this case, um, since it's the one, because the other sports are currently either 1A or 2A to 7A. Right, Prim primarily football, the, the financial driver, the one that's going to get the most attention. 
Yeah, so the task force did look at all sports as a whole. Um, they did, again, with football, they did consider the district championships and mandatory district play and stuff. Um, but with football, um, they did feel like, uh, again, given the um, thought process of some of, of the state, and again, I do agree with you that not, and even with this proposal, not everybody's going to um, like it. Uh, that, that's obvious with anything, um, but they wanted to make sure they were taking into consideration um, the, the thoughts and ideas of um, all schools when it came to it. And the idea was to include football. Um, the board, of course, has the choice to do with that what, what they would please. Um, but the thought process of the task force was to treat the team sports the same in this case and with still having rural and then having the open division would pull some of those larger schools and some of those traditionally uh, successful schools um, out of those classifications and help create more balance in the uh, rural through 7A with 32 teams of, of a higher caliber each year being removed into the open. That would be where the competitive balance would come in, which is, which is again why um, it actually started, the, the process of the task force started at eight for the open and then went to 16 and then they settled on 32 and they started looking at the teams and taking this, that type of question, which is a great question into account of, are we truly achieving the competitive balance that we want if we're only pulling eight or 16 teams out and, and does it take 32 to make sure that we're achieving what, what, the, what we set out to achieve um, with this entire process. And so that was, that was where they were coming from with that. Okay, and, and I'd like to piggyback actually on, on that because as I, as I looked at the teams, and I know I think this is all applicable in question form to the discussion at hand because it was mentioned the eight teams, then the 16 teams, then the 32 teams. As I looked at the 32 teams uh, for football as of last year, based on what was sent out, uh, one thing that I noticed that was in, in the top 16 um, the only schools below 3S were kind of elite private schools or the top seed in the state of a Miami Central. Um, so essentially, once you get from team 17 to 32, uh, you, you run a very inherent risk of, while there may have been some team that's traditionally a powerhouse that fell somewhere in that 17 to 32, what also seemed to um, potentially be a risk is that um, many of your community schools who happen to be on a good year with kids that they had from seventh grade all the way through 12th grade now fall into that 31 place and go play a team that has, you know, 23 division one stars on it. And so my question on that is what kind of then financial impact does that have on that community school who goes from hosting three district playoff home games to traveling somewhere and essentially losing in the first round? And then what kind of impact could that have on their student enrollment with controlled open enrollment? Because now students are sitting in a school where they know they have no chance at a state championship. And so they have a better option to go pursue an elite school somewhere uh, that is building in that elite program in a top eight or a top 10 type of a uh, program in the nation. Okay, um, we'll be answering. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can uh, yeah, attempt to answer that. I, I don't know that I'd be uh, able to speak on the economic impact. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, clearly there could be some. Um, the task force did have uh, discussions extensively for very long periods of time um, about this. Um, and what ended up coming out of it was that being in that top 32 or 16 or eight, whatever it may be, would be a really big deal um, to be in that, uh, just being in that alone. And, and, and they could uh, hang their hat on that. There were some others that had the same concern. Um, that, you know, now we don't have a chance to win that 4A. I think some, again, the, the thoughts were you know, if you have an opportunity um, to get into that top 32, it's a really big deal. It's something that we don't know um, because we haven't done it yet, but what kind of, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, it would be something where there would be some, some um, you know, television type stuff, especially with football that would come into play. 
again, I don't know that for sure. I'm, I'm kind of speculating, which I don't know if that's something we should be doing at this meeting, but I, I do think there would be, and, and this is something we can absolutely um, try to delve into more to in November or, or whenever um, to try to get more information on potential financial, uh, because it, it, it's a fair point. It's something that was brought up extensively um, about that, along with the travel. Now, that was part of that was the travel piece of looking at some of these teams, and that's where the North and South came in. Do we take those top 32 regardless, no matter what, and then find a dividing line in the state and play until we get to the um, last eight teams, and then re make sure we reseed based upon the rankings and play from there? Um, there was talk of doing just a, a North 16 and a South 16. That isn't necessarily pulling the best 32 teams. Um, in that case, um, if you're looking at just the power rankings of top 32, it could leave some of those out if they if there are having to be more than 16 teams in, in the north or the south in a particular sport. Um, but uh, you know, uh, it, it was it was discussed extensively, and the idea of it being such a big deal to get into that into that top 32 or 16 or eight um, seemed to uh, be the consensus of the group. I won't say that it was a unanimous thing, but it was the consensus. Um, what? And and then I guess the question would then become, would the open division be optional? Because if it's, if it's such an elite status, then clearly the teams that could truly compete at that level would be glad to do it. And the teams that knew they couldn't would compete for their state championship. Um, no, sir. Under this proposal, it would not. Um, uh, the, the, the thought process from the task force there was then you could have the you know top five teams decide they don't want to and that kind of defeats the purpose according to the task force of um, pulling out those um, quote unquote um, elite teams uh, from the rest of the teams and if those teams chose to go back into their normal classification the the idea of this would kind of be defeated that was that was their thought process because that that was also discussed um could it be is it mandatory or or could a team choose to remove themselves from it and they settled on being on being mandatory because then you know what if ever none of the teams want to do it or half the teams don't want to do it now now is it really um what, what it's set out to be so um but but great question that was that was something that was that was addressed okay thank you and uh and I mean, not not that I think this was the intent, but you know, then I think I, I think what you said is really pretty powerful. If the top five teams in a thirty-two team bracket pulled out, that would water it down. But that's almost an admission of the other twenty-seven aren't really able to compete with those top five, um, and so then they're sacrificial lambs for the sake of TV rights or elite status or whatever. Um, but I think the next the next thing to that would be the confidence in the Florida ranking system, because um, one one of the questions that I have is, would that still be the ranking system that was used? Because currently, the Florida ranking system has what's considered by Max Preps to be, be the 10th ranked team in the nation, ranked at 40th in the state of Florida. So they're number 10 in the nation by Max Preps, but they're number 40 in the state of Florida. And so would the Florida ranking system be the one that would be used and how would that confidence be built into really building that elite group status? Thank you, uh, Mr. Shirley. Who will be answering? Uh, Scott, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Ireland, get his hand up. Um, I think that's something that the board would need to discuss the, the rankings. Um, I can't speak on the max preps and FHSAA and the, and the discrepancies. Um, I believe as we get closer to the end of the season, they will shake out a little bit more. Again, the margin of victory that I talked about earlier is um, a large portion of the difference in those two, um, I believe. But uh, I, I believe Mr. Ireland did have his hand. Yes, yes, Mr. Ireland, go ahead. From questions uh, into almost debate. And I would suggest we maybe get outside the purpose of this meeting. Okay. So at this point, um, Mr. Shirley, do you have anything else specific to this? That I, I, I do. I'll, I'll totally, I'll totally shift, shift okay. my line of questioning because that was not my intent. I know. Uh, that's fine. So, so, um, so with the districts, um, districts are going to be there, uh, but they're not going to be required games. Um, would there be any teams 
that were not the district champ or district runner up that could potentially qualify for the playoffs in any division based on the model? Uh, uh, um, I can answer that, Scott. I can answer that question, President Gallucci. Yes. Um, currently, the, uh, with the proposal um, and with the current system, uh, the district champion is the only team that is guaranteed an automatic bid, and then everything else is based on the rankings, and that would still be the same model for the new proposal. It would still be handled the same way. So the district champion would get the automatic bid, and then everything else would be filled in via rankings. And as I said earlier, if the district champion happens to qualify for the top 32, then the next highest ranked team would be moved into that bracket to replace the team that was removed to the top 32. Madam Chair, Madam Chair okay. I just need clarification. Are just we talking a, about just football? A, Are we just talking a about moment. football or major just, sports? Just a moment, Mr. Norton. Let me, let me, I'll get right to you in okay, a moment. Just, but please, so that, so that we can just keep order. Um, Mr. Shirley, are you, what, did that answer your question? It, it did. So theor theoretically, uh, the fourth, the fourth place team in a district could be ranked high enough to make it into the playoffs, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, so they would, by, by default, by the definition, have a week 11 by if they chose not to play an additional game where they would rest and recover while the district one and two seed played an additional game against each other prior to going into the playoffs. Yes. Okay. Right. And so using that nine week schedule model, um, financially, wouldn't wouldn't that mathematically mean that about half the teams in the state of Florida would lose out on a home game gate, which is income, because very few teams are going to pick up that 11, 11th week game, because if they're not going to the playoffs, the coaches are going to take their supplements and, and run. If they are going to the playoffs, they're going to enjoy their buy. So so financially, doesn't that have an impact on a large portion of the state as far as uh, home game gates? Because now they essentially, instead of being five and five, they're going to be five and four one way or another. Uh, I, I can attempt to answer that. I wouldn't want to speculate on how teams would, would want to schedule at the end. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how that would be handled. Um, I would imagine uh, the, the task force did discuss um, that teams, uh, because only one team can have a home game, that there might be a lot of split gates for those games. You find a local team, you split the gate, both teams um, make out on that game. That could be something, but I wouldn't be able to speculate on whether teams would or would not play those games. And if a team was not going to make the playoffs, if they would or would not, I, I don't have an answer for that part of it. Um, but I think teams could find ways to uh, create uh, monetary between split <coughs> gates and such. Okay. That was I'm, I'm, I'm done, President Kaluki. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Shirley. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Norton because he had a question and then Mr. Kenna. I will be right with you. Go ahead, uh, Superintendent Norton. Well, I think my cha question changed about three times, but it's on Mr. Ireland. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Ireland, does this new board need to, at its next, this is a legal opinion, does this new board that we are consist of here do we need to ratify or acknowledge through a vote at the November meeting the standing committee that the prior board that has been disbanded put together that's brought this recommendation? I certainly don't mean to belittle the hard work they put into it. I want to be on the record saying that. And I know they brought some good ideas, but uh, I have more questions coming out of this meeting today than I did. But do we need to ratify them as our own? Do we need to appoint them? And uh, uh, I looked at a lot of names and I didn't know but one, and I know they're all good people, but uh, do they have authority right now for us to, like the planning and zoning board at a county commission meeting, they make recommendations. Absolutely. Uh, okay, Mr. Ireland, I'll turn Absolutely. it over to you. Absolutely, they have authority. They were appointed by a board of this this our high school athletic association, and it continues until it's disbanded by another board of the association. Okay, so if we wanted to simplify things, and I can always tell you, I want things simplified, uh, Mr. Ireland, I, I'm speaking to you, 
so we would need to be prepared to appoint a new board at the next at the November meeting, correct? If you have a motion second and it's discussed, then you can do whatever the body decides to do. Okay. So at, at this point, uh, thank you, thank you, Superintendent Norton. I appreciate that question. Um, what I do want to do at this point is um, then leave that for discussion in November at this time because that's a, a, a different topic. Um, Mr. Kenna, I open give the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. I, I have one question. Um, Scott, you can answer it. Are we going to do a survey of schools, of county athletic directors on how they feel about this proposal? Uh, we can if you, if you would like us to, I believe. Ms. Galusi, if I can. Yes, I yes, you may. Go, go ahead. Um, go back to Mr. Superintendent Zorn's question. Um, the committee was put together to bring a recommendation to me. I am going to bring something to the board. So just because this is being discussed doesn't mean I'm going to bring it to the board to even vote on. So they are a task force that was assigned to bring up ideas for me. Because typically the executive director would be the one to bring forth a classification proposal uh, to the board. So you guys may not even see this. I, they were put together to give me ideas. And I can bring choose to bring an idea to you or choose to say, we're going to continue doing what we've always done for 100 years. So just so everybody's aware. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And and I just to reiterate, if I'm correct, um, just for the board's uh, clarification from what I'm understanding, this is just recommendations that are being offered to the board. And we would ultimately be the ones to take action on it after debate, after deliberation. Uh, um, I correct and for clarification for the board, uh, Mr. Ireland, Mr. Uh, Damon. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tamargo, I see your hand up. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes, hear you perfectly well. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, I was driving home and, and um, listening attentively. A lot of my questions were kind of asked already, but I do have one. I mean, people play for, for state titles, right? That's our, our tradition. That's what we do and what we prepare for. Um, the best team doesn't always win, not the best team on paper. That's the beauty of sport. How do we ensure integrity of scheduling with these coaches when you're using a power ranking to rank your top 32 teams? How are we sure that middle team tier who's not going to be the top five team doesn't sandbag it? you know, do a, a crappy schedule and then get by to, to the state title. I think that's something that really needs to be uh, considered when we're voting on this. And I, I think, um, Mr. Tamargo, if I'm not mistaken, that's something that we can discuss and debate at, at our, our November board meeting. Am I correct, Mr. Ireland? Yes, sure. Not here. Okay. So, Mr. Tamargo, uh, um, point taken, and, and we can bring that I'm up good. for discussion. Okay. Um, at this point, any other Thank questions you. based on this? I just want to clarify, this was um, for questions based on this classification draft, which is in no way, shape, or form binding until if and when, or if we decide to or not, uh, you know, adopt it, that will be decided as an action item at our board meeting if we are up to voting on it or not. Uh, am I correct on that, Mr. Ireland? Yes, Madam Chair, it, uh, it will come before you with a motion second in the discussion. If it okay. okay. Uh, I know we are coming, uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so I do want to end promptly at 4.30 because I know people are uh, taking time from their schedule. It, are there any other questions, concerns, any requests that you would like from staff to provide to you prior to the November meeting uh, that you wanna make now. And, and I do recommend too that any points that you would like to debate, discuss, have discourse about, jot it down after this so that we can have a robust uh, discourse and conversation 
at the November meeting. Yes, Mr. Kenna, the floor is yours. I, I would just like a survey of uh, the, county, the county ADs and how they feel about it. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Damon, can we request a survey prior to the November meeting? Is that feasible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll, we'll get that done. Okay, perfect. Um, Mr. Smith, you have the floor. Yeah, and I, I, I know FHA say we'll probably do this, but just making sure I heard county ADs, but that could also be sent to all private school athletic directors also if we're going to do a survey. Mr. Damon? Yes, ma'am. We can, we can also arrange that too as well. Okay, perfect. All right. And, uh, Scott here, I, I'd like to we'll make sure we include obviously the charter schools, um, home education cooperatives, and everyone else that would need to be included in that survey. Okay. Yes, let's make sure we have everybody and we get that out. Um, Ms. Ritchie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm, I'm really sensitive to um, the concern that we have an opportunity to get feedback from uh, athletic directors and coaches and, you know, the, the people who, you know, who, 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 do, who do this every day. But I'm also really sensitive to opportunities for families and parents and students to get to weigh in on these changes. The kids are the ones that are directly impacted by this. Is there any opportunity for public comment or for, you know, for people other than school staff to get to weigh in on these proposed changes? Um, um, just very quickly, uh, Ms. Ritchie, I believe, and, and if I'm not mistaken, there is, everyone has the opportunity. If they sign up, they can make public comment. And we are, as a board, we listen to them and we hear what their concerns are. Am I correct with that, Mr. Damon and Mr. Ireland? Yes, ma'am, you're correct. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question or? Yes, ma'am. I guess I guess a follow-up to that would just be how are families notified of these proposed changes? Obviously, it's the job of an athletic director to monitor what happens at FHSAA. They're going to know about this. How do families and students receive notification of this opportunity to weigh in? Um, and I will turn that over to Mr. Damon and staff. We, we, we publicize a notice on our website, but classifications has been a discussion that's been probably in every newspaper across the state. Uh, folks have been talking about it on social media for quite a while now, knowing that we were looking at something for considering something. We even spoke to our student athlete advisory council on Monday committee that was here. Uh, 16 students from across the state and asked their input on it and asked them to go back and share with their students on their campus and so forth to provide input to us. So we, as best as we could, we try to get information out to the general public, but we also depend on our members to share Great. information. Great, thanks so much. To get Thank you, Ms. Ritchie. Are you good? Any other questions? Okay. Anyone else have a, uh, a question before we uh, close for today? Okay, um, seeing none, sure. I, I just uh, incur, I'm sorry, Mr. Shirley, it's just that the hand on your screen hasn't gone away. It's been up there the whole time. <laughs> no, ahead. I brought it down and then I just popped it back up, but I don't okay, have a sorry. question. I, I thought just I had seen say... it the whole time. My apologies. Go ahead. Sir. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, your patience with my line of questioning and for the for the input from the FHSA staff. Well, my, my pleasure. And that's what we're here for. We're here. This is and, and I want to thank Mr. Gregg, his team, Mr. Ireland, because that's what we're here for. And as a board, before we can make any decision, we need to be well informed because we are affecting the lives of many, many families and children and, and athletic directors and coaches. So we have, as a board have to be well informed. So I wanna thank Mr. Gregg and his team and the whole team that worked on this because it was hours of, of work um, to put this together and, and, and bring it to us um, because it was a huge undertaking. It's something that we need to look at now as a board closely and deliberate and comment. And this, I think, was very insightful. It was very helpful. I encourage you all to just come prepared to the November meeting with any comments, any questions that we as a board need to discuss in order to take uh, action moving forward. And on that note, I want to thank each and every one of you for your time today. I want to thank Mr. Ireland for his presentations, Mr. Um, Damon and his team for doing all of this and preparing us for our next meeting. I thought this was very insightful. 
if you could please um, just follow up with those the surveys that um, were requested for the uh, the different uh, schools and also the, the PowerPoint presentation. And I think with that being said, I think we can adjourn this meeting at 421 p.m. Have a wonderful rest of the week and weekend. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you.